he's trying to he's he keeps asking if he's had a physical or like a health check and he's like yeah. stop asking me <laughs> you know So, welcome to the Audio Book Club podcast. Today we will be discussing Calypso, read and written by David Sedaris. I don't really know how to sum this book up, but essentially it sort of boils down to 21 essays by David Sedaris, um, as is the style, I think, of all his books, all these sort of non-fiction essays. He just generally talks about life, you know, he sort of looks at the, the dark side, the funny side, the ironies of life. Definitely in this book, I feel like there's a few topics he focuses on, being his family, his relationship with animals, and then definitely just a few, at least in my opinion, just a few quite humorous, almost like sketches. So yeah, uh, why did I pick this book? I chose this book as uh, about this time last year, I just read David Sedaris's most recent book, Happy Go Lucky. That was after going to see him live with my partner, my friend. It was it was good. So his life shows he just essentially reads some snippets from his book, as I'm sure he's have sort of picked up um, from the audiobook, uh, as there's also some live recordings during this this one as well. But that was that was really it. I I really enjoyed uh, seeing him live. Really enjoyed Happy Go Lucky, and I just I just wanted to give another one of his books a go, and I thought this was the perfect time to to get things started. Get a bit of non-fiction into this uh, podcast. Somebody had to because it wasn't going to be me. <laughs> no. I, but I might know. <laughs> I sort of hemmed and had about non-fiction for a while. I know it was not our normal genre, but I felt like someone had to do it, didn't they? Yeah, I think I think we definitely had to do it at some point. It's just it's talking about it, I think, might be... We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, because like the, stru- the structure that we... Uh, intentionally like developed for the show before we ever started recording was based on fiction books so I think we've kind of been yeah. intimidated to pick a fiction a non-fiction because we don't really know how to adapt our structure to it it's uncharted waters but I'm excited yeah yeah this could be this could be groundbreaking uh, I tend to pick the really awkward <laughs> books to uh, the host don't they <laughs> <laughs> so I mean I think let's just move straight on to plot guesses <laughs> I mean I don't necessarily think there is much of a of a plot but uh just to refresh yeah. everyone's uh refresh everyone's memories so on the last episode based purely on the cover art michael had guessed it was a book about plank from ed ed and eddie <laughs> <laughs> and eddie also went on to say it's a book about an abusive childhood but with a funny spin Stephen also guessed it was something to do with plank from ed ed and eddie he read a bit more into the detail of calypso so he, he, Stephen seemed to think it might be something to do with the sea, based on that off awesome character that shows up in Pirates of the Caribbean. And Jonathan guessed it was nothing to do with Plank from Ed, Ed and Eddie, and he just felt it was more like... Which is a shame. <laughs> which is a shame he was wrong. I mean, uh, unfortunately, the book was all about Plank from Ed, Ed and Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> At least the one I read. That's, that's how I read into it. <laughs> Uh, I, fi- I don't think I actually said it would be about Plank for Ed and Eddie. I think I said the cover just looks like Plank. <laughs> no, that's how I took it, Michael. Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> but it's written there. You can see it. It's on the Discord. <laughs> but Johnny's guess was it was maybe just some sort of coffee break type of stories, which I sort of took to be like sort of watercolor stories, maybe just like we snippets of your day type of thing. And I, I, I think, I mean... I'll I'll leave it open to the floor. I mean, do, do do you think it's appropriate for anyone there to get a point for a correct guess? I think we all had bits and pieces of it randomly. I think, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know if we had an abusive childhood, but like, there was something. There was there was definitely themes of neglect in this book. Like, I, I mean, yeah. there's a there's a line where he sa- he says like how they would all get piggybacks on on their dad's shoulders because it was all, the only time their father would touch them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that line actually. Well, Stephen was right about the sea and the ocean, you know. Yeah, yeah, but he also says he also specifically says at one point that like 
you know, people name things stupidly, like Calypso, for example. So it actually doesn't mean anything. <laughs> so yeah. So I was I was right because of the, well, not right, but I had you know close because of the beach house thing. But other than that, my way. My other defense of my guess would be, I, I think I got the tone right of the book that it was. I think yeah, it was funny but dark. I would I would I would lean to agree with you. I would sort of be probably split between Michael and Johnny. I mean, Johnny was maybe slightly more vague. In his like yeah. just sort of stories that are some sort of coffee break type stories, which is not really a plot guess, more of a structure guess, I suppose. So, I think I will. I'll give Michael a point. Fortunately, Stephen, I I think just uh, see no, see isn't enough for you. Uh, I, I'm happy enough for that. Yeah, I think I think it's fair to give Michael a point. I, I think it was very vague. I think he did well to even guess that in the first place. You know, so I think he's all done well to guess. I think he's all slightly on the money anyway. Yeah. So. To to go on very little, yeah. That was, that was good. Raging, there was no plank though. I, I was I was disappointed <laughs> that the plank didn't feature at all. <laughs> if he had have been like watching an episode of Ed and Eddie at some point, then you would have had to give Stephen the point. Would have tied it all together. <laughs> so I I think I think we'll uh, just go straight into spoiler reviews because I don't think there's any way we can't we can talk about this book without spoiling it in any way. So. As we say, it's not fiction. It's not quite the usual uh, structure to a book. I've tried to sort of break it up into various different topics that sort of arise throughout the book. Probably one of the topics that gets the biggest focus of me was uh, the offer was David's relationship with his sister Tiffany. Um, she seemed to get a mention in quite a few chapters, and I think, like you said, the book just jumps into it. I think it's the second chapter, which is. Well, I, I sort of liked how this chapter ended. Um, it sort of ended with the, the line of the chapter. And it was quite sort of bittersweet for me. But this chapter just discusses the sister Tiffany's suicide um, just before she turned 50. I think it was about 10 years ago now. And then through, I think it's about three or four other chapters, he sort of dies into his relationship with Tiffany, I think, in a house called Divided, a story about Boo Hui, where he sort of talks about uh, paranormal activity being visited by ghosts and then the spirit world um, where the family visits the psychic. I think his sister, it's either Amy or Lisa, I think, visit a psychic. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it was Amy, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, does anyone have anything to say about how they sort of felt about the Tiffany-centric chapters? Or the sort of overarching storyline of, of David's uh, relationship with Tiffany? Yeah, I, th- I thought it was just kind of like... I, I didn't think he really focused on it too much. I think she was like mentioned in passing, like all the things that were going on and the other like plot points. Um, you know, she would be brought up every so often, but at the same time, yeah, there was there was, there was something there where he, he did keep going back to her. So I don't know, but then I I, I was doing some reading this morning, and I I think is the book before this was based about the sister in the relationship or something. Yeah, I think he. Uh, I think he. Sure. I think he does borrow some stories from other books. As I say, there are sort of collections of essays, so I think I think some of the essays do appear in other books as well, which I'm sure if you've read his other books, it may be a bit annoying. But yeah, so so like uh, yeah, I think um, yeah, I don't know what I'm trying to say, <laughs> but uh, I I wanted to know more about like how they fell out. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if I must or not in this book. But like it, it, he tells a story. I think towards the end, where like his sister visits him after a show one night, and he basically gets the security to shut the door in her face. Yeah, and that's and I was like, why? That's the last time he sees her as well. Like that's that's his last interaction. Yeah, with him. yeah. So I wanted to know why. And there was also a thing where they're when they're seeing the where he talks about the seeing the what he called the medium, and the, they get told that you know. Sister forgive forgives him and everything. It's like, but for what though? Yeah. What happened there? I wanted to know more. Uh, yeah, I don't think it is mentioned. I think that he just sort of talks throughout the story that, like, at one point, uh, like at every point, sort of during Tiffany's life, there was a period where she was like best friends of all the siblings and like just not speaking to the rest of them, and that just seemed to be the relationship yeah. she had with her family. Um, it was just quite rocky. I think just so happened to be having at the end of her life, yeah. Yeah, like I think there's just a lot of money issues with Tiffany, and like uh, drug use. Um, I know, I know, David Sadar had issues with drug use before as well, but I don't, I don't know if it was the same 
say drugs. Yeah, he mentioned, he mentions that, doesn't he? He says, I can't remember what it was exactly. She was she was on medication, like <clears throat> why she can't hold a job and all, and she's on some sort of medication. Or, yeah, I can't remember. Some American drug. <laughs> wow. That they love. Maybe, I don't know, crack or heroin. I can't remember. Um, I, in my no, head. We, I, it wasn't like, I don't think it was like a hard drug like that. I think it was like some pills Like or a something. prescription drug? Oh, was yeah, it? Like, yeah, like painkillers or something. Not too sure. I don't know. I just this is what I remember from the story. Yeah, but I just I just I like the way that like the, the, the first chapter is just nice, gentle, just a bit of crack about like about nothing really about like having guest rooms in his gaff, and then I think the opening line of the second chapter is just like yeah, my sister killed herself in this day. I was like, okay, wow, this has took a turn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's kind of handled like a bit like offhandedly at times, and it's, it is just brought in as a thing that happens. There's no like gravitas or anything. It feels like all oh, this is just a thing that happened. But I thought the way the relationship was described was quite powerful, and I f- I think it was good that he wrote with such honesty and didn't like didn't shy back from reflecting himself maybe in a poor light. For how he handled their relationship, especially towards the end, it was just uh, as Stephen said, he he went into detail about their last interaction and and was very honest about it. And it's it's obvious that Tiffany was suffering some pretty severe mental health issues in the lead up to her her suicide and exhibiting a lot of sporadic behaviour that can be quite exhausting to family members and people who are close to the person who who is going through that. So yeah, I, I thought they were good chapters. I thought I explored it well, and you're right. Like, he doesn't he doesn't sugarcoat anything. I like how he, this kind of touches on something you said there, Michael, but where he doesn't shy away from, like, talking about the, the bad things that he's done. Not bad things, but, like, you know, not great things. Uh, he does that quite a lot in the book, where, like, he'll, descri- he'll describe a, a scenario, but it's, like, a, in a sarcastic way where he's he said something, but you're supposed to, like, take it, like, you know, the opposite. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, because he's very, like very honest about his like his own flaws and um. Yeah, that's that's yeah. His his, his pettiness at times and his um the the obsession, which is uh you know which is something I can relate to anyway. That the chapter about the the Fitbit is definitely something that I was like, yeah, that's that's pretty much my mindset with things. You know, I'll get I'll get into something and become completely obsessed with it for a while. I did get that vibe, yeah. <laughs> 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 not by I made that same sort of connection. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't kind enough oranges though to make a fall comparison <laughs> or ball, a wee ball. A wee yeah, ball in the sounds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Johnny, have you, have you anything to add about the sort of Tiffany centric chapters? Anything you took away from that? Those few chapters. I think so. For me, this book I split it on the kind of a 25%, the first 25%, and the last 75 The first 25% where I, this, I think this topic spe- specifically, but, like, there's a couple other ones, I find just quite, yeah, depressing. And, like, just, like, knowing what I know about the rest of the book now, obviously, I thought this last 75% of the book was hilarious. So, like, I just felt like maybe it was just me getting used to this, this sense of humour, or even, like, I don't even know if he was trying to be funny or, or anything, like, most of the time, but I think just, like... It just, for me, it just got a lot more funny going on. I don't yeah. know if it's be- because it was just, yeah, like, hardened up to it then. But, like, the first the first three chapters for me, I was like, Jesus, this is hard to listen to because of, like, it's it's just not, it's very depressing, like. But um, I guess I'll talk more about the good, the, the things I find good then when we come to that later. But, yeah, I felt like, yeah, especially when it, it just goes, yeah, my sister killed herself. I was like, Jesus, like, <laughs> what, 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 is, what is this book? I was still trying to find, like, understand what this book was. So yeah, I was a wee bit like, just kind of a bit not not enjoying it too much for the first twenty five percent of it. But um, yeah, that did change then. That's interesting because like I had a similar experience where, well, for the the start of the book for me, I I kind of liked it where he just kind of like you know, blunt said that, about his sister and everything and all this you know all the things he was talking about. Uh, but then it went sort of, I thought it got really like depressing. Then the next little bit, and I I was like, oh, I don't really want to continue on with this but then the like you said the last 75 percent, i was like oh actually this is really funny and uh yeah. it was like a, a, a switch flick for me and i was like oh i get it now yeah sort of thing. i think that's exactly it 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I sort of I sort of had that divide too, kind of similar ratios, but it wasn't it wasn't that the first twenty five percent were depressing to me or anything. I was kind of on board with that story but uh, and that kind of narrative that it was shooting for the first 25 percent for me was just kind of like getting the stick of the book or kind of getting a feel for what this book was and what it was about yeah. and everything and i was sort of coming to turn like it took me a while because i don't i don't actually read descriptions or anything to the books that we do i just i just dive right into them so it was kind of like oh this this is like a series of vignettes or what i would later learn when i read into the book after i read it they're all essays that that he he has written previously, all kind of tied together into the one book. So it was sort of for me like the first twenty five percent was me getting a feel for what the book actually was. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Like uh, I think uh, although it was the start was a bit more depressing and stuff like that. I think yeah, it was more trying. Like it's not that I mind listening to something like that. It's just that I just wasn't either ready for it or just just because we haven't listened to something like that before. It just yeah took me a while to kind of acclimatize it. Yeah. I would I would actually agree with you as someone who has like read a previous David Sedaris book. Even I maybe found the first few chapters like I don't even know if I like a bit of a slog, but there was just something about them. It just like I know for me like the chapter where things like clicked and I was like, okay, I'm really on board with this book. But I I, I would I would sort of agree. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's like just they're slightly weaker stories. Um, I don't know if it's like maybe now looking back on them. We can sort of we can sort of appreciate chapter two a bit more now, knowing what we do know further down the line with the rest of sort of the Tiffany and family centric stories. Yeah, but I did think the the start of the book had some some weaker sort of one off like storylines, like there was the, the like the trip to Japan with sisters about the clothes. I I just yeah, like that would be a skip for me if I ever went back to it. I I like those, but just because I like Japan. So fair, <laughs> yeah. I was on board when he said. As soon as he says Japan, I was like, "Oh, <laughs> yeah." I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't a massive, massive fan of that one either. Um, I wasn't a massive fan of like the him complaining about the kind of banal uh, talk that like hotel receptionists and stuff do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, yeah. And I think awesome. it's mainly yeah. because I think he acknowledges himself that they've been given a script, but at the same time, it's kind of like you know they have been given a script. They're they're just doing their job. Like they're they don't want to say that stuff either. I imagine it's just nah, so so kind they of hate like themselves, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of it's not their fault, and they're not the people who should really be challenged on that. Do you know the thing? The thing for me was that the first couple of chapters I thought were okay, right? But then it's when he start, when he starts talking about buying the, the beach house and all, and I, I got the sense that like or I got the feeling that this was just going to be a book about like a, a rich kid moaning for. For like, you know, long, oh, I was like, oh, it sort of is, in fairness, really? but, <laughs> but yeah. well, it is. But then this is what I was talking about. Something clicked at some point where I was like, oh, it's not that though. It's him like kind of going against that. So he's all, he, he, sort of come to terms with him, him being like that, and then sort of you know suggesting that I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but there was something there where like it, it was that, but then he, he's kind of talking about it sarcastically. You know. Yeah, I think the fact that he's he's self aware of some of his behavior makes it more forgivable and and makes it more funny. Yeah, it's almost like he's saying he's say, he's describing his behavior to you, but you're supposed to like realize that he's, he was being ridiculous, you know. And once that yeah. sort of switch flicked for me, I was like, oh, actually, I really like this. Yeah, um, yeah, he's a very ridiculous man, you know. <laughs> Grant, um, I was thinking sort of next topic, just sort of taking on to like his relationship with his parents probably or would you like to sort of break it up with a bit more of a funny story first we talk about the the interlude but the first one where he does like it's it's him doing stand up did yeah, that it's... did that take anybody out of it or was it just me the first time the yeah, other i knew it time? was i knew it was common it was a bit jarring for me just because i had like not heard heard that on an audiobook before so it was kind of like what what is going on Kind of yeah. like checking my headphones. <laughs> is the stand up? Like is the stand up yeah, like yeah. part? Is it like part of the like the actual physical book, or is it just like inserts? Like, does he actually like have like a story that's written in the book, and that's what he's reading? It's the same. It's an it's an essay. He's just performed that essay live. Right. Yeah. So those, es- oh. those essays are on the written version, but he is so just, it's just a live it, performance for this. It sounds like more that. like stand up, but like it, it's like. 
it's like he's kind of like chaining jokes and like multiple punchlines. Maybe lines. he he de- delivers them differently when he's on stage or something. Mm. Not too sure. I don't I think know. Some he of the seems like the are... kind of guy who's like very prepared and has like memorized and rehearsed and everything. No, like uh, from seeing him from seeing him live, he literally reads out of a book. Like, oh, does he? Ah, <laughs> uh, like he reads it like well. You know, he's not just like staring at a page. You know, um, it is funny. I think he saves his funnier stories for the live audience. Yeah, I've I've read into the kind of his book about and how he, like his process and stuff, and apparently he uses his performances to see what stories land. And he he uses like the audience reactions to basically see what is working within the stories or what isn't. He said like if people are coughing, then he knows that he's sort of lost their attention. So he'll think maybe I need to trim that story back or break it up a bit or something. Oh, it's interesting. So yeah, I mean, we can we can chat a wee bit about the the live segments. I think there's maybe three of them that sort of pop up in the book. I would be lying if I could say I remembered exactly what the three stories were. No, I can't either. As one of the live stories, um, the one where he asks people from the he he talks about how he doesn't drive, but he is yes. fascinated by a road rage, uh, and he asks people from different countries when he's doing book tours uh, what their yeah. insults are. Yeah, that's, that's the last one. That was, I, that was really funny. Yeah, that's the that last really live funny. story. That's, that's uh, I, I liked that the title of that was like whilst you're up there, check my prostate, and I was like, oh, this is yeah. a story about him <laughs> like being at the doctors or some sort of gay sex thing but uh, yeah. the final insult being I mean you can probably just bleep this out Michael but the final insult being like shove your hand up my ass and jerk off my shit <laughs> <laughs> that's, or was it Bulgaria a, or somewhere that that's it like a thing Romania. say Romania yeah. 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 When, they're, when they're driving and somebody cuts them up I thought that was so because <laughs> so, I have heard people from like in other countries say things that, in English like like that yeah, and then I say, he says he like watches her wander off, and he's like, "There goes that poet or something like that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like uh, the, some of the live, at least I think I think another one of the live episodes is where he talks about having the gastrointestinal virus. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, and that's like both of those stories have me like crying with laughter. I find th- I find them to be so hilarious, like the. <laughs> Like how he just starts off that story about the guy in the plane who like shits himself in front of everyone. <laughs> he's up there for like half an hour. Yeah. And they make him trip out when they're landing. <laughs> and then I think was the, was the f- sorry. Go ahead. No, no, uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to talk about the other. Yeah, All right. Well, I was just I was just going to say, and then obviously in that one, like David then talks about his own experience with a quite a bad stomach bug. And how he spent like oh, it was like a week on tour, just trying not to shit himself on stage in front of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's that it was uh it was definitely a highlight for me. Somebody stood off stage with a bucket, which I thought was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> a bucket, like oh. <laughs> just like surely there's a toilet handy, and like she was just like he, he just, yeah, like, just had an emergency yeah. plan, a- exit plan. <laughs> I think so can, I think the if first... can make it off over to the the bucket, surely I can make it to the toilet. Yeah, right. Yeah, I know. Right. There's, surely there's like a toilet just off stage. <laughs> you would think, but maybe not. I think the I think the first story was it about him like going to other countries and uh, trying to speak the language, and he can't in some cases, or he doesn't know like four words, so he talks about going to Japan, and uh, and he tells some, them oh, somebody yeah. asks him what he does for work, and he tells him he's a doctor. Cause, uh, yeah, because he doesn't know because he doesn't know how to say author. he's an author. Or, yeah, yeah. Or how well, to I thought that was quite funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a pediatrician, yeah. doesn't he say? Yeah, a pe- yeah, a pediatrician, and everybody treats him differently. <laughs> <laughs> I did find the first life story the weakest. Yeah, see, I, I like the life stories, but it, it was the first one that kind of caught me by surprise. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I like this, but welcome back. I I do think it was funny. I like the insult to uh, may you build a house out of your kidney stones and then he goes into detail about <laughs> how horrible his own kidney stones passing them would be were. Uh, passing enough to build a house would be would be horrific. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the the very final insult is still my favourite. Uh, 
I think I'll have that Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have been driving when they said that too. And I honestly, I was like, I might have to pull over here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> pull over? I roll the weather down. <laughs> <laughs> Pull over so I don't crash I'm laughing <laughs> But yeah While you're up there jerking off my shit Just check the prostate a wee bit as well <laughs> <laughs> But yeah uh, I, I, I found the, the, the book Quite quite good And how it was able to sort of Intersperse these very solemn Stories, which, even though like there's still some humour Don't get me wrong But like the, how he's able to sort of Break them up with these these funnier sort of segments or skits almost at times. Definitely some of them didn't land for me. Like, uh, like I can't, it was the sort of reasons why I'm depressed, I think. I don't know if that was necessarily supposed to be funny, but I feel like it was just a lot of Trump chat at the start. I think I'm not really getting oh, this yeah. humour at all. I think that one was very dated to that era. Do you know, that, yeah. that kind of time where Trump was getting... You know, he was up for election and everything, and then he won it and everything. That I feel, I feel like that one specifically was very. It would have been much better, I think, at the time. But yeah, it's probably. Kind of like, and I know we're not here to discuss Happy Go Lucky, but there's a lot of stories about COVID during that. Right. Um, hmm. I, I think I think he's still like wearing his Fitbit and like just going for big mad long walks in the middle of lockdown and as well. So he hasn't changed his habits in four odd years, wherever it's been. Yeah. He's, Seems like he's very a very habitual person, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, just just speaking about the sort of Trump stuff, that will sort of lead us into the the relationship of his dad. I think in that story, when it starts off like a bit of a list, I think it maybe ends with him, um, like recounting this big massive argument he had about his dad after his dad voted in or helped to vote in Trump, and I think he sort of lingers on, uh, maybe like further in. Like a different chapter, but I think he definitely lingers on how like he doesn't want like this to be the final thing he does with his dad, especially after what happened with his sister. Yeah, yeah, but he does. I got he, that for sure. he, yeah, because his dad's he, in his nineties, so any any argument is could possibly be his last. And he said he only visits America like what was it like twice a year, so it very potentially could be. Yeah, up to the C section mostly. <laughs> yeah, which is funny. Yeah, like he, there's a quite a stark contrast in a way, like between his relationship with his two parents. Like he obviously seems to have got on quite well with his mum, but she's passed away like a long time ago. The signs of it. Um, whereas he struggles yeah. a lot more with his father, whereas some of his sisters See, don't really seem to. Mother. I wonder if he got along with his mother. I I can't remember if he said so or not, but there was times where she was being like homophobic and stuff, and I got the opinion that. It was more like he was looking back with sort of rose tinted glasses, do you know, where he, he only remembers the good stuff. Where's my? Uh, I wasn't sure. Maybe. Though. Yeah. You but then right. he did mention some bad stuff, but like I, I just thought there was something there where I wasn't really sure whether he, you know, had a good relationship with his mother or not. I I got the impression that he did, but again, like sort of speaking about his mum, you know, like he also dives quite into her her alcoholism. As well, in one of the chapters, and how they just sort of, just sort of ignored it because it was just like, yeah, that's just mum, you know. She's got it's only one drink. I think this yeah. is. I think that's also quite like rich white person where you know, yeah, they're probably drinking like a bottle of wine a day, but it's like, oh, they're rich, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're in control of things. Yeah. You know, whereas you sort of look at Tiffany and she was, she was per almost by choice in a way, but like they they all sort of. Had her as almost like a pariah because of her addiction issues. Yeah, I got I got the impression that he, um, I think he, he mentioned too that his mother was a storyteller and told them a lot of stories when they were kids. So I got an, an impression that he was probably quite influenced by her, and that in that regard. Yeah. yeah. And then, and in, in regards to his the relationship with his dad, it was a bit of a strange one because when he told stories with his dad, it seemed like they got on really well. But then there were snippets here and there where he seemed to imply that he didn't have a good relationship yeah. with his father. So it was kind of like, I was like, uh, I don't know what kind of relationship he had with his dad. But obviously the, the dynamic of the the liberal son or, you know, the liberal child and the conservative parent, it's one that's played out a lot across America, especially in the Trump era. And I'm sure it caused a lot of divisions in a lot of families. And it seems to have played out in his family as well. 
and obviously him, him being a gay man he would you know feel quite you could almost take it as like a personal kind of slight to almost vote somebody in tr- like trump onto the office uh i think he said I, I listened to like an interview with him and i think he said something to the effect of if uh, if adolf hitler came back from the dead and he promised his dad 17 percent off his taxes his dad would vote for him <laughs> so kinda, i think says everything about how he feels about how it was a very selfish vote f- from the perspective of his father yeah see his dad as well I, it was another one i wasn't sure of because like you said michael it seemed like he got on with him when, when he, he tells the stories of them talking and stuff. But then there was the times for sure where he just like, I was like, how do they even speak to each other? Like, <laughs> you know, it yeah. seemed like they really hate each other at times too. Not hate yeah. each other, but don't like each other, you know. But then, I, 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 again, I think it, it was like the same sort of thing where he's kind of trying to remember the good times with his dad rather than think about how he's such a conservative, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it could be because he he's, it doesn't he say to he, he doesn't he wants to try and avoid arguments with his dad, but I don't really think he ever describes nah. many arguments. It's only the Trump one was the big one. Mm. Trump the Trump yeah. one, but then I mean I don't know if you want to call them arguments, but you know when he's like he's trying to he's like, he keeps asking if he's had a physical or like a health check, and he's like yeah. stop asking me. <laughs> so, you know it, there was a bit, it seemed like there was a bit of an annoyance there, but it wasn't really like a an argument I wouldn't say. But, uh... And that kind of showed like the care side of his dad too, you know, because like he's he's trying to make sure he you know gets looked after or you know make sure he he looks after himself and everything. So yeah, I sort of took that as his dad's like sort of being maybe like a wee bit senile, like repeatedly asking the same question as well, though. You know, I think it was it was it was two things. Yeah, I think it was that and that he you know it was annoying for him <laughs> that he, he he kept asking about it to make like the dad kept asking about it to kind of almost make him do it, you know. But yeah. yeah, I think that I think that was a double thing of senility and just kind of forced hand, you know, care for somebody. Yeah, and his dad seemed to have well, at least the opinion I got was his dad seems to have a better relationship with with the daughters in the family. Like they can seem to sort of come in and like chat away to him. But the signs of it's where I think David sort of says he really struggles to find a topic. I can't remember which chapter it is, but I think they. The only thing they sort of seem to mutually agree on is like jazz and their love of jazz. Yeah. The dad made me so sad though at some, at some point. You know that bit where he's like having his sister just find him in the street and he's like, you know, he's get sort of dressed up and stuff and he's like, they're like, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, I was, I was looking for someone. And you, I, I was like, oh no, he's gone, he's gone see now. Like, he always wandering about aimlessly. But then he's like, yeah, I was hoping to find somebody who would invite me in to watch the, the, the football game. <laughs> that is the saddest thing I've ever heard in my life. Oh, like that. Yeah. But like in a nice way. Not like, oh, he's so sad. More like, oh, yeah, that is sad. <laughs> <laughs> that made me sad. You know? um, Johnny, have you anything else to add? Have you sort of, had you got on, or sort of, like, you know, were you sort of green of these stories by this stage of the book? Yeah, I think this, these stories were okay as well. Like, there's the ones that I'm hoping they talk about is the, the one with that, more about the animal ones and specifically the turtles. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I don't have anything Save the really best for that. Up, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, any, anyone else have anything more to add about, about the sort of family topics explored in this book? Well, I'm curious just because I think the next book, he, he talks about it a lot, right? Can you, can you confirm? It's more yeah. centered around his, his father, yeah. From uh, memory, uh, there's a lot more about his dad, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I, I, I'm kind of keen to kind of maybe pick that up, but I'm not sure at the same time because I think it might make me sad. <laughs> but do you, do you guys remember what the uh, what was like the really homophobic thing that Tiffany said to him, and he was like, "Wow, how long has that been in there?" He said <laughs> so, right. something like. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember what they were talking about, but she says, why don't you go and write more stories about being a F-word? Oh, yeah. That's and right. Was, yeah. That's right. <laughs> a gay person. That was, like, that was in there for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> imagine that, though. Like, well, it's, you can't really imagine it because, I'm, you know, I'm not I'm not gay, but, like, imagine somebody, your, your sister, just randomly turned around and said that to you. I, would, like, yeah. I think that would crush me, to be honest. I think probably that stage of the relationship... That was probably just like part and partial, almost. I thought that was when they were young enough, but... Oh, was it? Maybe it was. Maybe you're right. 
I say young enough, but like old, older than we are now, but like, <laughs> you know, 30 years ago or whatever. That, that story, in my mind, for some reason, they were like teenagers, but I don't know. Yeah, I think that's that sounds about right to me, but I, I can't remember. Yeah, can't remember what age they were supposed to be. Yeah. You might be right. can't remember. You might be right. Um, but he doesn't really talk an awful lot about his life as a gay man. Obviously, it's probably something you've had to sort of pick up. I, mean, I don't think it's something that's particularly left vaguely. Like I think he talks quite quickly about his partner, Hugh, maybe even in the first chapter. But there's only really two stories, I think, from memory to sort of focus on the about him being a gay man. And one was like the sort of whole gay marriage being legalised in America. Yeah. And how he was like, oh, we'll, we'll get married for the tax purposes. <laughs> <laughs> and the other was uh, just a, quite a short story. I think it was about like three, four minutes maybe. But the where he essentially asked you what his number was. Like, you know, how many partners had he yeah. had? And he an absolute shagger. <laughs> shagger. Yeah, shagger and he, ta- he talks about kind of like, I think he was like 30 or something, but he talks about, I think he doesn't he briefly touch on the kind of the AIDS epidemic yeah, too. Yeah, and... he talks about AIDS. Yeah. And how they, they, yeah. how they, he wonders how them two messed it. Well, yeah. I think, yeah, he, he wonders that because I think you had like half a century of partners or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, the, and probably most of those was during the 80s and 90s when they were younger yeah and that, I think that ch- chapter ends with him calling Hugh a whore he yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I fair. like that he didn't he didn't uh, you know focus on the you know sexuality much um, because I think that would have sort of detracted from the whole family aspect of it I know he mentions it in context with his family like with the sister and the man and everything but I think if he had a d- dove deep into that it would have taken completely away from the you know, family and health side of things. It wasn't Never the main focus he... of the book. You know? No. Like, the focus was family. Was it... Did, did he say this, or was he describing, like, Hugh saying this or something? But he, he says something about, like, oh, I don't know why people have to, like, shout it from the rooftops or something. Something like that. Was it about coming out or something? I think in that, he's just talking about, like, you know how, like, some, some like, right-wing people get, like, very annoyed at gay people just existing and, like, being with him. Oh, I th- I thought he said that. I must have misinterpreted that. I thought he said that, I and mean, then that's why he doesn't he wasn't talking about it so much. But fair enough. I think I think at this stage we sort of talked through most of the family stuff, and I think well, what I believe to be the the main event of this book, I've sort of left for last. Johnny touched on it quite briefly, but um, the story about the about the lipoma and the turtles. I think is the, I think is just the crowning glory of the of this book. How did you guys feel about about David's interactions with the turtles? I liked them. I I think they, I think it was my my favorite part of the books was when he was like a dragon with turtles and everything. At the same time, though, I'm not so sure about the lipoma. I I don't know if I believe that <laughs> as a story. Just it just seems it just seems a bit mad. I don't want to get out there too much and spoil it, but. I don't trust the, the the story about it getting cut out and everything. That just seems too mad to me. I mean, it's just a wee lump on like the end of his like top of his skin. You know, it's not. It's yeah, not but like it's, not, it's not. It's not like an actual. Okay, trailer. it's not so much of getting it cut off. It's that he that some random person said they would do it for him, and he was like, "I know, ball. Go ahead." <laughs> I was fully engaged. I fully believed it. Why would he lie? No. <laughs> yeah, it was a. Definitely a very strange fixation that he had to to want to feed this, <laughs> you know, fat, this fatty little tumor to to the snapping turtle. I was because I think on the, on this podcast a lot. I've always like tried to dissect character motives and stuff. I have no idea why he wanted to do this. <laughs> um, <laughs> was I think completely. Yeah, because I, I, I kind of wonder, why you know, why does he want to feed it to the turtle? And then uh, I think it's more, it's because he, he kind of muses on how the turtles will eat anything. So he want, I think he wants to see if it'll eat his tumor. The funniest, the funniest part, I think, for me, like obviously is this whole book, but the funniest joke is when he's on about <laughs> feeding it. He's like, yeah, you can feed these and anyone. You, you could feed a tumor to these turtles and they did it. It's because like, 
you can't fit it there like a dog because a dog would like eat it and then turn around and give you that fist where it's like, is that a fucking tumor? <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely <laughs> lost it. <laughs> I thought that like the whole, this whole thing was just, was hilarious. Like the whole story of us feeding the tumor. Like, and like the yeah, turtles come up a few fun. times, don't they? He's, he's always like feeding them something. And like, um, I think the main point, this is like, um, you know, obviously whenever you get a cut out by a normal doctor, they don't let you keep it. I was like, that's a bit strange. Like he says that too. He's like, like it is you grew it. Like why, <laughs> if you want it, like surely, I mean, unless it's something that's contagious or whatever. Like why you shouldn't you be allowed to keep it? Like keep it in yeah. a jar. It's like, just like, keep like if I got if you if you got your fucking like hand cut off or something, like is that the hand doesn't belong to you anymore or what? <laughs> sure, that's your, that's your that's hand. Like. I need it to get the the skin grafted onto my cyborg replacement. Won't work otherwise. But um, no, it's just it's just so funny this chapter. I think it also explains the cover art of the book, where he like talks about his fascination with how expressionless the turtles are. You have that kind of expressionless cover. I think that yeah. sort of Do you think ties I, it I, ties I, it together. The the chapter that he first mentions the turtles and mentions the tumor, I think, is also the chapter called Calypso. You know, I I think he also felt that it was the best bit of the book. I I thought that the the cover was meaningless, much like he describes the title. Like it it doesn't have meaning. It's just a word or a, or a picture. Do you know? That's what I thought it to mean, but I guess it's open for interpretation. I think that is the point of the title, like. But that that's why what I think the kind of the cover comes from. Then I can see that, Mike. I I think that's a fair point to make. Like the the turtles being expressionless, and then just like well, like this quite a dull wee face, just sort of staring back at you at the cover. Yeah, because that's specifically what it kind of talks about with the like. Just Jonathan talked about the dog, where if if a dog had at it, it would it would have a different reaction. <laughs> whereas a turtle kind of just you know, wouldn't take a it. wrinkle out of it. <laughs> that's funny. Though. Do you know as as sad as the turtle story was when it ended? I think the fox one was sadder. Well, the fox just didn't turn back. Didn't come back. He, he, ha, he has this like he develops this relationship with a fox that lives near his house in Sussex or wherever, wherever he lives, and he like goes out at midnight and all the you know feed it and stuff. And then his partner's getting really annoyed about it. He's like stop feeding him because or stop feeding her because she'll keep coming back. And you know he names her Carol and everything. I thought that was <laughs> simultaneously really funny, but also really sad when the fox doesn't come back because it probably got shot or poisoned, doesn't it? Or poisoned, yeah. Yeah. That's that's really sad. But it brought the old fox and the hound trauma back. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he de- he definitely strikes me as a person who loves animals. Which is weird because I don't think he has like a pet or anything. I don't know, just yeah. the, maybe you know. I don't know if he does. I can't remember. I think does he talk about him and Hugh having a pet at one stage? Oh he does, doesn't he? They used to fight about how they look after the cat. I think That's David it, yeah. was like of the side of just like feeding everything where Hugh was like, nah, like once a day. That's all it's supposed to have. But they want that's what they want. They just want food. They love to be fed. Just give them what they want. Yeah. I mean you all see my cat, she was absolutely rotund at one stage. Right. <laughs> Jasper's the same, but he's a white scranner. He'll just he just, he just not you all the time. Beagle stuff. <laughs> super right. I wonder what I eat a tumor. He probably would. On the well, I don't know. He, he, I think he might try it, but then he would be like, like just, "No, don't like that." And they turn just around and look at him like, "Was that a like he, he won't eat fruit or anything, <laughs> which which is nice, right? But he'll spot that back out again. So I imagine the tumor might not go down so well. So you get find those dogs that like. They like, <laughs> really find it. You get them dogs that like they just like as soon as they see the food they'll eat it so quickly that they probably don't even taste it. So like we Milo used to be like that. I used to fucking you just give them something just inhale, just it. inhale it. Uh, so yeah. like would they even stop to think what well, what is this that I'm eating? If you threw twelve pieces of ham up in the air, none of them would touch the ground with Milo. <laughs> 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 Uh, Milo should just eat, just eat and bite everything. Like so, yeah, he was just a monster. <laughs> <laughs> you were allowed in the same yeah. garden as him, like. That's right. Yeah. Do you tell me about that, kid? That was fun. That was your fault. 
Uh, it's not my <laughs> fault. They shouldn't have gone with it. <laughs> I didn't get that. Stephen, you taught him a valuable lesson. True. <laughs> that kid is probably a successful scientist or something because of that. We won't have that. <laughs> terrified He's like dogs. fucking the, the, the lizard from Spider-Man. In my defense, I was the only one there when like, I was petting him. And he knows me. That kid just wanted to copy me. <laughs> yeah. What a boy. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, does anyone have anything else? Like any final tidbits or anything they'd like to, to discuss? About about the book Calypso. Yeah, I kind of want to talk about his like his obsessions. We sort of mentioned the Fitbit, but he's also goes about letter pick, letter picking and stuff in Sussex. Which, yeah, which seemed a bit random that he just does that. And I, I I was wondering if there was like a, you know a reason where something you know something happened when he was a kid or something or I don't know. He's just or maybe he's disgusted by rubbish or something. I don't know, but I was kind of intrigued there. I just think he just has nothing else to do. <laughs> like, I don't yeah, need start that because he was doing the steps. Yeah, but but where does the letter picking come in? There? I get the walking it side just, of it. Like, like but it probably was like a, like he's doing the hunt when he's walking. Like, there's no benefit all to himself. So he's like, I can as well at least be doing something useful for everyone else while I'm doing this. Yeah, walking gives him a sense of accomplishment because I think he was even. But they say like some kind of truck or some kind of yeah, you- uh, garbage thing was like named after him. Yeah, you know how they they, they do that. Yeah, they, they named it Pig Pen, which is his like nick, local nickname. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, and there's like I think it was he said he was invited. To, I don't know if he says this in the book, but again, I think I saw this in an interview. He was invited to Buckingham Palace because of his like good deeds. Right. Well, apparently, funny. like there's like a, a host like of this party for like or this gathering of do gooders, and he was like invited to that. The Justice League. <laughs> but like I just I just thought it was really interesting and like you know he goes about with the, the high vis and all so that was quite interesting and the nickname just just a wee quick tidbit so his nickname is Pigpen which I thought was doubly funny because he also kind of sounds like Piglet from Way the Foodie once I made that connection that's all I could see when I was listening to the book just Piglet talking to me hey, I wanted to mention like maybe about his his actual voice because I remember Jason you said when we started like oh, um, I forgot you'll, either, with you'll either like yeah you'll either like the sound them or you won't so just interested to see what geez, everybody thought about what, what he actually was like to listen to that was a fact targeted me wasn't it Jason <laughs> <laughs> no like I like uh, the first time I heard his voice I was like oh this is a strange voice like I, I was just, okay. just warning you yeah I, th- I thought it was okay usually I'm the one that does the biggest issue with the narrators but I thought it was fine I, I liked it you know I thought it's not it's definitely not the traditional kind of narrator slash radio person voice because I know he came from like he or he was on uh, This American Life which is a podcast I've listened to before of like Ira Glass and that was ca- kind of like one a big thing that boosted him so Eddie doesn't have like the traditional voice for it or anything, but we're we're saying that you know as as Northern Irish people, we've not got the traditional podcasting voice oh, either. Yeah. Uh, but I, I I like that uniqueness, and I think that you know it's it's good to have other voices, and and I liked it. I thought it was a good storyteller. You can tell that you can see why he is why so many people attend his reads because he just has a kind of it's a very common way of reading but it also draws you in i never felt bored or anything at all during this book even when that was like stories describing these sort of mundane slices of life where it could have easily felt boring but it never really did for me yeah and i think that was partly due to his delivery yeah i I think it's important as well that he read it himself rather than someone else i'm not sure about like Oh, I don't know if you would even call this an autobiography or what you would call it but like you know this is real stories I think it's important that the person that they happen to reads them, like, yeah, because they're the only ones who can really tell the story properly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, or deliver like you said, deliver it and and the the way it's meant to be, you no know, heard type of thing. So I, like I it, he delivers yeah. it like a comedian, like, like yeah, he's, yeah he's that actually too. like he he knows how to deliver like the actual punchline of the story. Yeah, 
and yeah, I think yeah. his voice is quite quirky as well. I think it added to the like the the funniness, like just like his reactions to something. Like there's a point where he's talking about you know his, his height. He's saying like he's small and like like <laughs> uh, it's, it's not like it might be like the hotel receptionist or something like that, or I can't even remember who it is, but it's on about like some guy that's like six foot or whatever and she's saying that he was like small and david's like uh if that guy's small then what the hell am i yeah and they saw yeah. uh, just, just like a, a speck or something like that he's just a just speck. the way he, like lovers uh he's like he yeah, says yeah. a couple of things there he's like i'm just just a wee wee nothing like a, a wee speck and he just he just does it so calmly but he, he says it like he's like it's almost like he's not annoyed but he still feel that he was annoyed by it it's it's yeah very very impressive the way he did it yeah, I think he's just like exasperated by people in general. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, what, what what did you call the house again, Jason? The C-section. The C-section. The, the, the C section. Yeah, the C section. That's a big part of the book as well. And um, you know, you know, we return to that setting a lot. I think there's a funny part where he's kind of like he's always wanted, you know, to have a to have a place for everyone but that he bought it so they would have to abide by his rules and <laughs> constantly thank him yeah, yeah he, likes, he, he, would, likes he would be able to like there. choose the decor and anything without any objections you know i thought it was going to go the opposite way right i i thought he was going to get annoyed that like you know sisters kept turning up or something when he first mentioned about it you know i thought oh it, it sounds good now david but and i keep you know next year when the family's all there and you just want to be there by yourself or something. It's going to really piss you off. I think when he did, when he did learn the rules to this card game, the sorry so- is they call it. Is it a card game? Yeah. I thought it was a board game. I, I, I don't know what it is, but it's some kind of it, it seems like it's like a game they made up. I thought They're it was like, a whole like game, yeah. Well, yeah, like, yeah, they did find out uh, the rules that we should play it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a board game. One thing I wanted to sort of bring up while Stephen was chatting about the uh, litter picking, um, I got distracted because my hamstring cramped up in the middle of all that. <laughs> <laughs> was the time he was out litter picking and he found the, the three inch um, yeah. strap on. <laughs> He's like, as soon as I yeah. put this in my bag, I'm going to get killed and find it on my body. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> That story was really funny, yeah. And then he talks about, like, you know, you get rushed to the hospital or whatever, the morgue or whatever, and they'll be, like, looking through his stuff. <laughs> I'll say to his boyfriend, you know, they have this and that. He's all, yeah. how, how big was it? <laughs> Is that what you Yeah, no, he's, he's, he's a funny guy. Yeah, funny guy. Yeah. So, yeah, thank, thanks for all that, guys. Um, so I think now we'll, we'll move on to, to the star ratings. Does anyone particularly want to go first? Give their give their opinion, or I'm I'm happy to if no one else wants to go. Yeah, I I thought it was it was good. I I enjoyed it. Like I said earlier on, you know, there was I enjoyed the start, and then there was a, a section there where I was kind of like it felt like a bit of a slog, but then got over the hump quite quickly. I actually picked up another book in the meantime, finished that, and then came back. Which which I, w- I kind of wish I didn't do, but yeah. Uh, and then then I got over the hump. And that, the rest of the book was just gold from then on. One, like I said before, once that switch sort of flicked, it was it was really good for me. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, that being said, though, I think I'm hovering on a three, like kind of middle of the road. You know, I thought it was good. I don't know if I would listen to it again. But I do want to listen to his other books. Maybe the the latest one at least the one with this you know his father and everything. So yeah, I think I think a three for me. Okay, thank you. Um Jonathan, do you want to go next? Yeah, I thought uh, the first twenty five percent, as I said, I found it quite slow or just yeah, but very depressing and it's just kinda of wasn't don't really get the humour. But as I def as I said, I warmed up to this in the la the se- other seventy five percent, and yeah, I just tr- thought it was absolutely hilarious. Um, I just loved this, just as uh, as honesty about how he actually like feels about people and stuff like, and just yeah, those observations are just just quite funny. Like, yeah, the, the best part for me was the the whole turtles and the the tumor um section, and then the the boy crapping himself on the plane was also quite good. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of. Puts in here, I was like laughing out loud. The, the stand-up bits were funny, but 
but I just I've kind of been conflicted about the do you know it's it's like that's like a, it's just like listening to a stand up as opposed to this being an actual book. But I mean, I guess is there is there anything wrong with that? Because like, is that that's just part of his art? So you know, why is that not okay? But um, yeah, it just felt a bit weird having stand up just in the middle of an audiobook. So it was something different, but it's just more essays. It's just more stop stories. You know. Yeah, just that the actual like you know having a live crowd and all laughing while you're listening to this audiobook and stuff. It's uh, it was just a bit, bit strange. But um, no, like I said, I did really enjoy the stand up. It was just yeah, just something different. But um. Yeah, just to summarize it, all in all, I really enjoyed this book. Um, found it quite entertaining, so I will give it a four. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, uh, Michael, would you like to go next? Yeah, um, I I also I, I really enjoyed this book. Um, as I've said, I I find it a, an easy listen. It was I was never bored during it. I was just like oh, having it on, just constantly with it and everything. It had all my attention, and I was always intrigued by the stories there were a few ones that didn't quite hit for me and and like jonathan i, I wasn't a massive fan of the stand-up but i don't think it's it detracts in the book from the book in like a massive way or anything by any means i, I liked I, I really liked the the family dynamic and kind of the themes of uh of family dysfunctional families and mortality in the book i like the balance of humor and darkness in the book I liked uh, David Sedaris's honesty and his writing and his simplicity and his writing and the way that he never kind of flattered himself or he always was very honest about his own flaws and his own shortcomings. I kind of at times uh, I saw, saw another reviewer make this comparison, but I, I actually had the exact same thought while listening to it that uh, somebody actually compared it to like a Wes Anderson movie, kind of his family dynamic and, and Wes Anderson is one of my favorite directors and I actually had that thought listening to this as well. And so it kind of it kind of uh, gelled with me well and everything. Um, I did have a few few issues, uh, like I said, with some of the stories. But overall, I really enjoyed it. I, I would give it a, a solid score as well. I think I'm going to give it a four as well. Thank you, Mick. Um, I would just, actually it's like quite interested about the sort of Wes Anderson, Wes Anderson family dynamic. I think I would agree with that, actually. Yeah, that's sort of... Almost a loof family dynamic in a way, uh, but yeah, I would I would sort of be more leaning towards yourself and Johnny as well. Um, I think the highest I've scored a book is four and a half, and I've uh, I I don't think I would go just as high for for Calypso. I did I really I liked the book I liked the book. Don't get me wrong, quite funny moments at times, quite devastating moments, like especially the bit with. With Tiffany being sort of having the door just sort of shut in her face, as I say, some moments I was genuinely like almost in tears, like having to pull the car over. But it it did sort of vary. I would agree the start of the book uh, is probably the weakest bit for me. So I think I'm just gonna have to bring it in at a four out of five as well. Um, so I don't know what that would sort of bring the average to. You guys are so so generous. I'll tell you the way the average is uh, three point seven five. Well, that's not bad. Not bad at all. Um, I thought you'd go higher, Stephen. Actually, I, I was surprised. I just, you... I just, I'm, I'm sort of more conservative with my scoring. I thought it was, I thought it was, okay. it was a good book, but I, I don't think it's. I think a four is too high, to be honest. Four is like a book that I really loved, and I would like for me anyway. It's like a book I really loved that I would listen to again, but that's not the case here. I just thought it was good. Uh, I, w- I would listen to this again and check out more of his books. Three, three respectable score. That's a problem. <laughs> I know what's it's above half. Like. Yeah, three's a meh. Three's well, a meh. Uh, is it a meh? Nah, I I changed my answer. The score of one for all this. <laughs> <laughs> Jason gets um, a score of one for host the host nah, score. Terrible host. Three point two five. Job. Nah. Cramped up during hosting duties. <laughs> hosting can Good be stuff. intense on the body. <laughs> yeah, nothing to do with the five aside from. Three hours ago. <laughs> yeah, see all those people running their marathons and thinking they're good, just try and host a, an episode of this podcast, then you'll you'll know what intensity is. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if anyone has any comparisons to other media. I don't know if there necessarily is, apart from what you know, Michael maybe said about the Wes Anderson family dynamic. So, I mean, does anyone have any comparisons? Does anyone have any trivia regarding Calypso? For comparisons, I guess... 
anything where uh, people are feeding tumors to animals, like just <laughs> any, that kind of genre. <laughs> no, it's, I'm just don't kind of, go ahead. Sam. <laughs> kind of picked out the trivia bits and like you know the thing about the uh, the the truck being named after him and the fit or the uh, what do you call it the piglet thing that I said. <laughs> I think, I think we've picked out yeah. the trivia. Yeah. I mentioned that I, w- I started on This American Life and everything. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I don't know if I've ever listened to This American Life, actually. I've heard of it. It's probably, it's probably the most popular podcast in the world after the Joe Rogan one. Like. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, I've heard of it. Like, I, I knew it was insanely popular. I was like, I'm going, it's a stupid thing to say whilst recording a podcast. But. It's completely <laughs> off topic. But I, I don't get why Rogan is so popular. I It's just okay. Don't I cut that out. No, I, not I really a fan. don't get it, man. You're not a fan? Rogan's, nope. He owns the podcast space like this. This is dangerous talk. Yeah, well, cut it out <laughs> if you want, Mike, but I, I just don't get why. <laughs> you know. It's, I like. I listen to like a few of his apps. Like, some, it, like, it depends. Like, it's who he talks to. Like, when he talks to someone like, like Elon Musk what? or something, like somebody you actually want to get a wee bit of insight yeah. to them. But I uh, talks he talks to obviously so many people like from all different places and like he's all he's all about his conspiracies and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, he spreads kind of a lot of pseudoscience. Like yeah, so yeah, and he's just he just uh, he's all right. Like he's I'm not I I don't listen to it, but I've watched a few like just I uh, like famous mathematicians or like scientists and stuff. But uh, I wouldn't watch like every episode or anything like religiously. I think he's he's created a lot of bros as well. Yep. I think it's Keep like you just gotta drop sure. some D- DMT and go eat an elk and shit like that. <laughs> you may you as just well like talk another language there, Michael. <laughs> just gotta go drop some DMT and eat a tumor, you know. <laughs> back back to uh, the book or David uh, Sedaris. You seen him? You said you seen him live, Jay. Like, does he just do readings, or does he actually like do stand up like proper? It's not. It, it, it is like it, it's all. It's all readings. It's all essays. Um, he sort of talks about his process. I think he just like writes as he does. Like goes about his day. Like, I think he I will think just he sort of speak diaries. to. He kept, he kept mentioning yeah. it, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Like he just sort yeah, of so jots even, things down as people say it. You know, he just he has like more of an offer then. Like then he's trying. He's obviously an offer as opposed to a comedian. Even though he does yeah. write funny things, it's it's more. Just because he's Mick, because that's all, that's all comedians do is Mick observations about the world, but just deliver it in a funny way. But that's what he's doing. But he's actually just doing it about his own life, his actual real stories. Yeah, I think yeah, he said all, he said that he leaves he leaves a lot of like stories on the cutting room floor as well. He doesn't include everything that he's written between then. It's just it's kind of what he thinks would fit together. Mm. Yeah, so it is just all all essays and just. I think he just goes about his day. Like even when he's probably out for a walk and like picking up rubbish, he's probably still got like a, a diary on him, just in case, you know. And I, I think then during a the live show, he maybe from memory, I think he does like a bit of a Q and A segment, and and then he sort of he will be signing books afterwards, as well. I think he does talk about that during this book where well he does because that's how he meets the lady who uh, cuts the tumor out. Uh, uh, like allegedly. He just, Allegedly, Stephen <laughs> doesn't believe it. That's why he gave it a three. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he would spend quite a lot of time just chatting to people as he sort of signs the books. It's not just like he would sign it and be like, right, where you go. I think he will like ask a random question, get speaking to you about something, which unfortunately might annoy you if you're sort of standing behind that person in the queue. But that's part of the experience. Yeah. But I would highly recommend going to see him live. I think I would like it because he, he seems to have a sort of rare mind where he's like very inquisitive about random things. And that appeals to me. Yeah. No, he's, he, it was very entertaining night. It was good. Didn't they say how you just would randomly guess people's star sign? That was and funny, yeah. Like, oh, the people I, that he that would, was a good story. <laughs> the people that he would get would be amazed, but not knowing that he had got like 10 wrong before them. Uh, yeah. he's like he's like, how, how, how the hell do you know that about me? He's like, the same way I know your sister's in the hospital or something. Yeah, that's the basic <laughs> way a lot of scams work too. Uh, they just say things that are are like the way most people have it. Like that's the way like they just make like as general assumptions that like you can make about anyone. Like you, yeah. you've lost someone close to you recently. Like fucking nearly everybody has. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just yeah, it's just how they how they do it. Like at least cold read now, where they like you know the famous ones where there's like a you know a, a medium in, in quotes 
where they're like, you know, they ask a remote, you know, I'm sensing someone called Ted. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. That, that yeah. kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. Somebody's family member's in the hospital, and then, or, you know, something like that, and then somebody obviously goes, oh, oh I mean, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you ever watch the, the Lummy sketch on that? I love that, yeah. Parasite? Yeah, the <laughs> Parasite. Uh. She's doing stairs. Can you, can someone understand, please? <laughs> yeah. Uh, just looking for a simple yes or no. <laughs> And I think that's a it's gonna be segue to our our next part of the podcast. What what are we consuming? What are we up to these days? Anyone doing anything Let exciting? <laughs> are you actually watching the show or you planning on it now? <laughs> oh no, I just I might do actually. It's been a while since I've watched it all. Actually, like oh, you always just like I you know have like liked the like on my page or whatever on Facebook, so I always get like some clips from the show, but I haven't watched it for you since uni days, but. I think it's on iPlayer player now. It was off it for a wee while there, but yeah, much much the same as always for me. Like just uh, watching slow horses and <laughs> ran, like, random stuff. Um, started listening to the Abroad in Japan audiobook. That was actually really good. Uh, that's the book that I was talking about earlier, where I randomly started it in the middle of this one. Fascinating. Oh, uh. <laughs> Japan's mental. Like <laughs> I would listen to that book for for. If you if you're going to listen to that book for anything, it's for the mad stories that he tells about, like just Japanese culture. It's crazy. They have like this, you know, like if you're going out somewhere, right, and you you know you obviously not going to drive because you're not drinking or whatever. So you get two taxis, one in, one out. They have this thing where like you drive out, right, and then when you're like you have the pints or whatever, and then you can call this service where two guys will turn up. And one of them will drive you home in your car, and then they get under the other guy's car and leave when you're home. Man, it just wouldn't work here. It's good for you, but it's kind of like an unnecessary second car. Well, no, but see, I know, it's, it's, justi- I, know I understand just- why the car's needed. No, no, but, but the justification is for for like the two people, and you know, instead of just having a taxi, because like they don't have to buy a taxi, like pay for like licenses and stuff for like taxis, not. Because it's just them driving their own car. You know, so there's, there's, dodge. there's benefits there too. Mad. But I, so listening to that, slow horses, uh, just, and yeah, just coding. Coding away. I had hoped to have uh, better news for you, Stephen. Um, Shut up. Don't I, stop talking. What? No, don't tell me. Don't give me bad news about slow horses. It's not, it's not bad news, no. Well... It's good news. I, I was hoping to tell you that I had finished season one, ah. but unfortunately I only made it through uh, about halfway through the sixth episode of the first season before starting this podcast. So. Ah, all right, so you're flying. That's, that's good. No, that's, what, there's one episode to go? No, I think number six is the last in the first season. Six is the last. How are you finding it? I'm, I really like it, uh, but I have no interest in reading the book. Nah. <laughs> That's what I think I even said that in the episode that the show was better. Yeah. And I read them the wrong... Well, I think if I read the book first and then watched the show I would have appreciated it more, but while I was reading the book, all I was thinking about, I was just picturing, like, you know, Gary Oldman. You know. Big smelly like, Gary Oldman. Smelly guy. That's his job. It's nice. <laughs> I, I've been watching a show called White Lotus. Uh, watched the Greta and I watched the first season. It's about like a fancy hotel in um Hawaii, and there's there be scandals. It's kind Ooh. of like it, it's a it's a HBO show, so it's their usual high standard. It's pretty intriguing. It looks like it's like an anthology one though, so it's going to be a different story in the second season. So I'm kind of not sure how they're going to continue it. With it, with it being the same standard as season one was, but I'll check it out. I've also Same. been playing. Sorry. Oh, go ahead, Jason. I mean, I've only watched like two episodes of season one. Um, I just never got around to finishing it. I don't, I don't think Mary Kate was too keen on, so I just sort of fell away from it. Yeah. But I think in season two there is a recurring character from the first season. I can only do that so, sort of thing. Um, but I, I think it's like a completely different cast apart from from this one recurring character. But I, I don't want to say much more because I don't really know much more. Yeah. What's that? What's that on? I, I might pick that up. 
It's HBO. I'm watching that on oh, so it's Noi on TV. My TV. Yeah. Noi TV, yeah. I enjoyed the first two episodes. Yeah, it's good. I really like the the manager character. Yeah, the guy from the Last of Us. Yeah. Who? Hey. Oh, the 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 gay lover in episode three of the Last of Us. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't. I don't even think I finished the Last of Us. <laughs> Ron? Is it Ron? Well, the from third Parks episode. Is there's a gay love not, story. Not Ron. The other guy. The other guy. The guy that Ron captures and then falls in love with and then has the most beautiful love story of all time with <laughs> and it made it made the baby boomers so angry oh <laughs> made me so emotional oh my god <laughs> if i've cried as much watch the tv show ever <laughs> <laughs> oh that was a tough watch all i heard was it's it's woke gone mad ah everybody trying to say it wasn't in the game and it's like well it was heavily hinted at in the game yeah. yeah. And also, things don't have to be exact copies of things, you know? <laughs> no. I think they so, adapted it really well. Yeah, faithful, but you can still do, like, you know, you know do I some. Expanded it, like. Yeah. Expanded it, yeah. It was really good. Sorry, Mike, keep cutting in. What, what else are you up to? Uh, so, I, I don't. I probably have over the course of this podcast they've probably chatted about gaming the least but because I, I only get like either one or two games a year these days and I, I would play that finish it and then put it aside so the uh, I've talked about Harry Potter recently that was my one game so the second game that I've got here now is the Spider-Man game oh the new one? yeah the new Spider-Man game played played bits and pieces of it but it's really it's really good and uh Jonah, my son, he's a, a massive Spider-Man fan these days. He watches like the Spidey and his amazing friends, which is like a kid's Spider-Man show on Disney. He loves that. So he just sits there and watches me play. So it's an, a way for me to be able to play games without him wanting to take the TV away from me. So it's <laughs> it's working out well at the moment. It's a, it's a good game, I think. Yeah. I don't really think I'm up to much. I say I'm slowly make my way through slow slow horses. Um, in terms of video games, I I'm trying to finish the DLC of Horizon Forbidden West, but that's it's good. But I just feel like I just need to sit down for like a day and just blast through it so I can finally finish the game because I'm already about the hundred odd hours in, and now it's just sort of like even though I'm enjoying this, I would like to try a different game now. Oh yeah, I've had that a bunch of times. It's almost like stubborn, where you're like, I need to finish this. 100 hours is a, a lot of gameplay. Like, you definitely got your money's worth with it anyway. I know. I've, I got this game, I think it came out last February, like 2022. So it's almost two years old. Yeah. So I, I'm determined to get it done because I just kept like putting it away to play other games. And it's the type of game where if you do put it away, it's like difficult to get used to the controls again. So I'm determined to finish it on this like final run so I can forget about it and play something else like i really want to play the new god of war dlc and i think i might be getting resident Evil 4 remake for christmas so did you uh did you finish Baldur's gate no see that's the problem i got like 20 plus hours into that as well before i think maybe spider-man came out then and then i moved oh, on yeah. to spider-man spider-man Baldur's gate's really good i just it's again i know it's like 100 it's, plus hours yeah. so i'm daunted like i'm scared to go back to <laughs> Yeah, it's one you really have to invest the time into, yeah. or else you will lose yourself and you can't start again. <laughs> you know what I've been watching snippets of? Is just to go to more Spider-Man talk, the <laughs> because Jonah likes to watch it too, the 90s Spider-Man show. And you know how you revisit things that you watched as a kid and you're like, oh, it's it's not as good as I remember it being. The Spider-Man show, it, it it's a bit melodramatic at times. It's a bit like when it's supposed to be dramatic it's funny and humorous but on other, other times acted? i'm like <laughs> yeah but on yeah. other times i'm like god this show is actually really good and it kind of it did mcu things way before the mcu like it it did the big shared universe and it did these big scale stories well, the comics on, did on that. screen yeah but on screen before oh, yeah. the mcu i don't think i watched it very much but i knew the show you're talking about yeah the one where the the point at each other meme that that's uh, what I comes from, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> I think I think that might be the sixty Spider Man, is it? I think that's sixty <laughs> Spider Man, maybe. 
Yeah. I think it is. I think that's the yeah. actual comic Spider-Man. Or like, well, old cartoon Spider-Man movie. I, we were talking there, he's talking about 60s, a dozen end stuff. Um, or animated stuff. I went back. So at the minute, we, you know, don't have uh, like internet in our house. It's coming tomorrow, actually. So I've been. John, it's age. You've not had internet. Ah, uh, this whole, whole fucking. We were supposed to get like a virgin on, and they hope the whole handlebars on them. So we, they, they ended up canceling us on then. But anyway, regardless. So I've just been watching like stuff like down because I can get like 5G. Like say at certain spots of the house and download stuff on there and then watch it offline. So if I've been using like Disney Plus because you can, yeah, I can download stuff. Um, but if we want back, do we watch like the, the the old Disney stuff? I'm on about like the, the original like the twenties and the thirties stuff. Like, oh, it's yes. just like going down this mad rabbit hole. Like so, I was watching all like the the, the shorts, uh, like Steamboat Willie and stuff like that, and like. They're absolutely mental. Like they're, they're actually hilarious. I was like, how's like stuff like from then? Do you want know, to find funny now? But I think it's it's funny because like it's it's doing random stuff like that because back then this is all fucking brand new. Like, people have never seen like moving pictures like this. But uh, yeah, it's just like so random, but it's so funny. But um, yeah. So I was like gone back, watched kind of a lot of the shorts, but I, I watched there. I've just been watching the very first animated Disney full length film was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and I was just watching it, it's, it's mad like like how many things and just like life or like reference to these Like so I was watching that and then the day that I was playing golf with my dad and he started singing you know the hey ho hey ho we're off to work we go he started like just <laughs> singing that and I was like that's absolutely madness like that that's what that song is from and then also what is the coincidence that he would just be singing it the day after I just watched that <laughs> but uh, it's mad, like like where all the all those references come from. So kind of like, just working my way through the old Disney movies and the history of kind of Disney. So there'll be more updates to come on that. I'm going to try and watch like one movie a week on it. Talking about like childhood, childhood TV programs. For whatever reason, when I think about like a childhood TV program, I always think of Shell and Showdown. <laughs> yeah, what a show! But I I right. feel like it wouldn't hold up well. Uh, no, probably not. <laughs> mm, probably. Stephen, didn't you say it was Beyblade was really bad when you I, went back to it? Yeah, I, I was a couple of episodes ago, wasn't it? I watched the, like, the first yeah. 10 episodes of Beyblade and it was just so bad. It was like like <laughs> you were kind of getting that, Michael. The acting was so like over the top, melodramatic and stuff. And like things they were Beyblade. saying just didn't make any sense. Like, <laughs> things that they, that they were saying just didn't make any sense because like talking about these things as if they're controlling them but they're not they're just spinning like, <laughs> it's quite funny <laughs> yeah the music was it, good it felt like that though <laughs> it felt like that too when you were spinning your own Beyblade yeah your Beyblade yeah, would just pe- stop the, and the, be like intensity. god I'm such a failure <laughs> you know they rebooted Shoulder Shoulder Jason no I've just I've always I've always thought about it I've always uh, thought about going back to it just uh, I, show bet, it I bet this me. already exists exists as a podcast but it makes me think of like a, a millennial or like a time capsule 90s kind of thing where you just like watch all the all that kind of stuff right, let's get it set up on our <laughs> podcast yep I'll, I'll maybe stick with the episode on tonight and get back to you <laughs> um, any uh, any plugs yeah showdown showdown podcast that I'm starting <laughs> 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 I'm taking that wrong yeah no, <laughs> usual YouTube stuff for me be in the description, haven't done anything but it's just that time of the year, uh, you know February yeah, usual stuff for me uh, check out The Dark Tales, check out Soul Bonder, links will be in the description, I should have a couple of new episodes by the time you're listening to this, so check it out I actually meant to say, I actually meant to go back and rate the episodes, I found your most recent Dark Tales episodes Probably to be my favorite. Um, the, really? Was that, was that the thirty-five minutes one? Is it number four? Oh, it's just the one that's told by the character Sophie. Yeah, I think so. With the yeah, that... with the with the blurry man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, it was kind of like a a mind melt to write. It was kind of like my head is going all sorts of places. <laughs> I was uh, I think that was your 
your strongest one in my opinion yeah thanks yeah it was a it was intense to write anyway i think like the the latest one on that too that i'm writing so it's gone a bit mental as well but we'll see how that turns out <laughs> i'll keep it out um uh, no plugs for me uh i'm born don't do anything physio, surely. <laughs> i will anybody needing physio around uh in, in the Glasgow, in right? Glasgow. <laughs> so I say Glasgow, <laughs> check me out. <laughs> Don't even want to say the name of the place. Um, no, that's that's it. Like, um, so I think we'll just we'll move on to to our next uh, our next host. Is it Michael? I believe. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So Michael, you happy to take over? Give us a wee give us a wee idea of what we're reading next. Yeah, I'll take over from here. So uh, my, the first, my first choice of last year was Mistborn, which obviously everybody loved. Oh, everybody just loved that book. It was universally <laughs> liked. <laughs> uh, it's not nice and someone but, doesn't like uh, it, is it? Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I kind of said at the time that we were overdue doing a fantasy book. So I don't know if this is going to be a thing where I, I've already said that I'm going to pick like a Stephen King book a year. I don't know if I'm going to make this also a thing where my first book yeah, of the year is a fantasy book. <laughs> yep. So I'm thinking, can I do one of the classics each year? So I, I, I ran it by you guys in our group chat. I, I asked, what kind of length would you be comfortable with? And, and you guys basically all said that you'd be okay with doing the 28 hour book. Uh, so... The book that I want us to do is The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss, read by, I don't know how to say his surname, Rupert. I don't know if it's Degas or, or, or Degas. Degas, but, um, maybe? I don't know. I'll put the, uh, I'll put the cover here into, into our chat if one of you want to try and describe it for the listeners. Just a second. I feel like you... You described this on a different episode one time. You, you I mentioned think I, it anyway. I can't. Remember I brought it up way. on the. I brought it up. I brought it up a couple of books on the Mistborn episode. A couple of fantasy books. Yeah, you definitely told me about this before. I've just seen the cover. I, I think I looked this up before. I can't remember anything, anything about it, but the cover definitely is familiar. Yeah. Do you want to describe the cover for the listener as best you can? Yeah. For so the listeners. Uh, so yeah, it looks like uh, so somebody wearing like a, a cloak. Uh, in a hood and they're standing in what looks like a really overgrown forest that's like covered in shadows yeah so at the end of the so behind him is like a, a really bright light which i assume is to show you know how dark it is inside so it's like outside but yeah yeah i think it's pretty spot on um and i and i so you already know that the genre and the length of the book i don't know how much that adds to like how much it informs you but any any plot guesses for this? I'm gonna put put it out there that it's it's very like the magic. It's gonna have a magic system that's based around like nature, so like the wind and you know trees and stuff somehow, like the earth. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure other than that. Some sort of lone wanderer. He goes out the forest at some point. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's gonna be about a uh, plank from Eddie and Eddie. <laughs> i'll i'll guess that it is this guy is the main protagonist he is some kind of sorcerer or wizard or whatever insert magical name of male figure here and he is yeah he is a very mysterious character who is searching for something and this forest is where he's been led in his search and yeah it's it's gonna be a bite I don't know if it's him trying to find this item before some other people, um, bad people, or this could be the bad person. I don't know, but um, yeah, journey of trying to find some item, um, by a wizard, basically. <laughs> nice, Jason. Yeah, I, I, I think looking at this, I mean, I think the name, I, I think wind probably lends itself to being probably more of like the the elemental sort of set of things. Like I was already assuming that it was going to be some sort of fantasy magic wizardy sort of story so just to sort of mirror what Stephen had said I think it's more likely to me going to be probably like uh, the elemental magic or you know 
maybe like his his school of magic or whatever she like wins magic something like that maybe there's like other elemental sorcerers maybe like a bit like sort of avatar the bald kid avatar yeah the bald kid not the blue people <laughs> yeah. that's, um, that's Michael as well yeah <laughs> I think again, Johnny sort of touched on something as well. I think I think the person in this book actually they don't particularly look like a friendly character. I'm sort of like quite dark, you know. Maybe it's something like that their sort of journey from like the dark into the light because it sort of looks like the movie about to turn around and walk towards the light to me in this uh, this novel. So maybe maybe they've sort of grown up in like some sort of dark, overgrown place, and then they. They leave to sort of change their life for the better. I also know just on the dark and the light thing, and just some that it looks like their face is like half dark and half light, sort of lends itself to what you said there. This is my bad as well, but you guys, I'm, I'm gonna lock your guesses on and just tell you that I probably should have told you what the name of the series is that this is part okay. of. Okay, <laughs> the series is called The King Killer Chronicles. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't change anything about my guess. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it, if anything maybe strengthens my guess. But yeah, he tries to kill the king of the forest. Lockdown. <laughs> Lockdown. <laughs> he's an evil boy. The actual, he looks. The, he's a bad. One. The W in the ones has like branches coming out of it, like the actual font itself. So I'm assuming the power is something to do with like controlling plants or controlling trees or like they're maybe they're like out like wood elves or something like that you know I mean like the forest is very key here maybe it's just up behind the park just up <laughs> yeah i think they go under this forest and they cut down a few trees and make plank and then it's... <laughs> and tree beard comes after him it'd be an interesting one to do i think a lot of people will be looking forward for us to talk about this book can't wait until steven hates it yeah i hope i don't hate it <laughs> Steve's at <laughs> ten times speed. I don't want to hit any books, okay? I, I want to like them all, but no more Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> there there will be more Sanderson down the road. I quit. Is it time to quit? <laughs> Twenty episodes is good. Right? <laughs> no, I'm excited. Sweet. So, one more time, Michael. What was the book narrator offer? Uh, the book is "The Name of the Wind" by Patrick Rothfuss, read by. Rupert Degas. I think I'm it's Degas. Say. I'm gonna say Degas. <laughs> yeah, probably cool. Degas. Yeah, Rupert Degas. And although I have read the book of this, I've never listened to the audiobook, so I have no idea what he's like as a narrator. Well, it's gonna make it make or break it for me. So here's hope. <laughs> Could be a fun twenty eight yeah. hours for Stephen. Mm. <laughs> well, well, t- fourteen I mean, hours and times speed. five. <laughs> <laughs> right. Chat these later. Hey, All right, catch you on the flip, they flip. No, that's my cast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see you on the flip. Fuck you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I forgot to ask you, Michael, if you had, if you ate any tumors in honor of David Sedaris's book. <laughs> I haven't. Um... I, uh, our famous segment that I always forget about and never do. <laughs> that you've not done since like March. Of the... <laughs> Which you only did like two times. <laughs> yep. I think I did. I did eat skier. Like before we did the. What was the Iceland book we did again? Journey to the center of the earth. Journey to the center of the earth.